Well, welcome everyone back to our third class of Way Less for Life by Dr. Ann Cools. We are at the Medical Bureau at Eastwood Trafficway with Kansas City, and uh, I'm Kathy Berry, registered dietitian with the Fountain of Health. So, welcome everyone. Um, we have talked about the first of, of 12 of these tips and tricks to help us lose weight, manage weight, maintain weight, and some of the big topics were avoiding white food, white starch, white sugar, um, making sure that you have protein with every meal. Protein is very substantial and filling and sticks with us. Um, fat also gives satiety to meals and it doesn't raise the blood sugar in the same way that refined carbohydrates can, so having healthy fat with every meal is also a really good idea. We talked about fiber, we talked about having a volume at your meals with lots of vegetables. Um, so all of those things were really about nutrition and then we also talked about some behaviors. So we're going to talk some more about behaviors and not all of these things are going to apply to everyone. And again, I wouldn't try to do all 21 things at once, but I think you're going to find yourself in some of these and you'll go, oh, I could, I could probably try that and that might help me. And again, you know, this is not a diet. This is just like a really good eating plan. The way that I eat, the way that I manage my weight, the way that I cook, the way that our family eats. And so let's get started with that. Okay, number 13, downsize your dinnerware. Does anyone have their grandmother's china or their grandmother's dishes or their mother's dishes? Yeah, they're smaller, aren't they? Yeah, the dishes, dinner plates used to be nine inches and now they're 12 inches. So what do we do when we have a bigger plate? There you go. There you go. And when you go to those like big Italian restaurants and they bring you out the big bowl of pasta, it's like enough for four with the big. So absolutely, when we have larger dinnerware, we fill it up and we eat more food. So smaller your plates, bowls, and eating utensils, the less we serve ourselves. My mother still kind of scolds me sometimes because I really like to eat ice cream with the serving spoon. Now, I know that that really isn't the way that you should eat ice cream, but we all fall into that habit. So, you know, I could definitely see myself in this. So research has shown that smaller dinnerware can have a big impact on how much food we consume. And in the 1960s, the plate was nine inches. Now they're big. They're pretty, but they're big. And if they're, you know, we just, like you said, we fill it up. So your plan of action is use a smaller plate. Get out your grandmother's dishes or use the, the luncheon plate. Um, did, um, you had a comment? No, I said I have to go home and measure my plate. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, mean, I didn't realize that it started at 9 inches and now it went to 12. Yeah, yeah. Because normally you just, like I said, the issues you eat out of bowls, you know. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, <coughs> that's, that's very true. So a dessert bowl in place of a regular bowl and a teaspoon in place of a t standard spoon, you know, like the bigger spoon. So exercise. Now this is something that I really, really want to talk about. Exercise is one of the most important things that you can do for yourself while you're trying to lose weight. It is very difficult to lose weight just by exercise, but it is completely possible. I think it's also kind of difficult to lose weight just by your diet, but when you put the two together, it really, really works well. And it works well for a variety of reasons. And when you exercise for a long period of time, years and years and years and years, you really benefit from not just the physical aspect of exercise, but also the mental aspect of exercise. So we're going to talk about that. So studies have shown that exercise improves the, least, the release of appetite suppressive hormones. You know that leptin that we talked about? Your stomach makes leptin, your brain makes ghrelin, leptin satisfies your hunger, it kind of quiets your hunger, and ghrelin activates your hunger. So exercise kind of calms down your appetite a little bit, so that's really good. Exercise burns calories and jump starts your metabolism. That is the truth. And so the earlier in the day that you can get your exercise, the better off it is because it increases your metabolism and then your metabolism doesn't come right back down. It stays up there. So if you exercise at 7 o'clock at night and then you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, first of all, it's very difficult to sleep because you're all jiggy. And then, but you also don't have that opportunity to burn those calories for longer. 
So exercise is really, really important. But this is the other, this is the other story of exercise. This is five pounds of muscle, and this is five pounds of fat. I'm gonna pass these around so you can play with them. But this is, and this is five pounds of fat that comes from an obese person. Everyone has a layer of fat that, you know, covers your muscles and covers every organ, and it, and it insulates and it protects, and it also, it protects uh, against injury, and it also is, keeps us warm. So we do need some fat, but this is, you know, five pounds of fat. And then this is five pounds of muscle. This is a big calf muscle. But when you look at these two things, you can see that this obviously is going to burn more calories because look at how red it is and look at how much blood flow it has. This, does this have any blood flow? So if it has any blood flow and you can't get nutrients to it and it can't, doesn't have blood circulating through it, how possibly... Can it burn any calories? Yeah. So that is the story of exercise. And that is why the lean, muscular people have furnaces for metabolisms. Because this is really clear when you look at it, is going to burn more calories than this. And you know that old saying about muscle is weighs more than fat and is smaller and denser? Well, it it sort of is. I mean, it's not hugely, this is five pounds and this is five pounds, but when you hold this, I mean, it is denser and it is somewhat smaller. So that's why when your pants get looser but the scale doesn't change, that's why. You're a little smaller, you're a little denser because you have more muscle, but the scale doesn't change because it's a little heavier. So there you go. That's the story of muscle and fat. And then when you think about, I lost five pounds of fat, you never really think about what five pounds of fat looks like. That's five pounds of fat. That's a lot. The fat looks jiggy. It is jiggy. <laughs> it looks jiggy. It's like a lot of jiggy. It is jiggy. And the is just firm. Yeah. It's dense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that is the story of muscle and fat. Um, exercise burns calories, jump starts your metabolism. Regular exercise decreases stress and helps against emotional eating. Now we have all been in this situation. Raise your hand if it's true. I, I think we all have. You're having a bad time. You're having a rough go. And you just say, I'm just going to get up and I'm just going to walk away for it. I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go for a little walk. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to walk away for a few minutes. And while you're walking, the problem still is there. And perhaps you don't even figure out a solution at that time. But when you come back, somehow it doesn't seem quite so heavy. Does that? Yeah? Well, that's what this does. Regular exercise decreases stress. It reduces your blood pressure. It reduces cortisol. It reduces all of that stuff, and it's just a little bit lighter. And so for no other reason, you know, if, you, if you're not going to make five pounds of muscle turn into five, you know, from five pounds of fat, the thing that exercise is hugely important for is stress relief. And everybody has stress in their life. Everybody. We live in a stressful environment. We have stressful jobs. We have stressful lives. You know, everybody has it. And so exercise is like your, that's like the first thing that you can do to help handle stress. So regular exercise decreases stress. It also builds lean body mass, which leads to more calories burned. So that's, that's pretty clear. So your plan of action, first of all, who likes to exercise? Good. Who doesn't like to exercise? Do you exercise anyway? Um, no. no. Okay. Some people, some people say, I like to exercise, so I exercise. Other people, like Oprah Winfrey, say, I don't like to exercise, but I exercise like I bathe because I know I have to and I know I need to. And so whatever, however you figure that out, but it still is like something that you have to do. Your heart needs it. Your muscles need it. Your brain needs it. Your stress needs it. Walking is completely fine. Actually, walking is great exercise because most people, you know, it doesn't take a lot of equipment. You can, you, you can be 85 years old and you can still, you know, walk for a mile. So walking is wonderful, wonderful exercise. Um, so choose anything that you like. It doesn't matter. It can be swimming. It can be riding a, a stationary bike. It can be getting on your treadmill while, after you DVR modern family. 
you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but as long as you exercise. Interestingly enough, though, our grandparents did not go to the gym, and they didn't go to Zumba, and they didn't do a triathlon. Anybody's grandma do a triathlon? I mean, nobody ever did that. But they were just on the go all the time. They worked very hard. They had a garden. They, you know, they walked farther. They did more labor. And so it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you keep moving. So it doesn't have to be the gym. It can be walking. It can be mowing your yard. But so all those little tips about parking farther away, you know, just getting more walking in, that is really, really true. And that's exactly what our grandparents did, who were leaner than we are now. So keep moving. Every step counts. Um, of course, you know, if you've got some health issues, you might want to talk to your doctor. And then on page 95 and 97, there's some really good tips and tricks about um, exercising in the morning and all the benefits that it has for you. So those are really good. So read through those. Um, and a lot of people tell me I don't like to exercise, but if I have a friend to go exercise with me, then I will because I don't want to let them down. You just have to figure out, what do I need? What do I need to make this happen? Because it really, it re when, you, when you marry a healthy diet and then exercise with it, then you're really successful, really successful. And people always tell me, I, you told me I, I was going to like exercise one day, and I didn't believe you. But you know what? I kind of like it now. I mean, it really does happen. You really do miss your walk if you don't get it after you. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. We were not designed, when you stop and think about it, we were not designed to sit in chairs. That's not how we were designed. Our biggest muscles are our quadriceps and our glutes. We were supposed to travel. We were supposed to be walking. And so when we sit in chairs and we look at Excel spreadsheets all day, we end up with, you know, tight necks and tight shoulders. That's not what we were designed to do. So, you know, getting up from your desk, taking a walk, even if it's 10 minutes, that's 100 calories you wouldn't have burned otherwise. So that's the plan of action on exercise. Um, so exercise is a diet pill, so just do it. If I could put that in a pill and give it to everybody, we would not, we would not have a, 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 a weight problem in this country. So the, your goal is at least 30 minutes of, of um, most days. And people sometimes also tell me, I don't have time. And we all know people who are really super busy and they still get time to exercise. So it really is kind of a priority and you just have to fit it in when you can fit it in, however you can fit it in. Even if it's 10 or 15 minutes, that's better than zero minutes. So there we go. Okay, number 15, find strength in salad. And this kind of goes back to the whole um, volume and fiber thing, but it is a very good idea to have one meal a day be a big salad or one meal a day start with a big salad. Salad is, um, it really, really gives you a lot of bulk and a lot of vitamins. And then when you marry that with a healthy oil, remember the fats have a, uh, they leave the stomach, they have a slower emptying of the stomach, so they stay with you and they keep you full longer. And the same thing with vinegar, so when you have a good uh, kind of a, you know, a vinaigrette dressing or a Italian dressing or oil and vinegar type dressing. That is very satisfying and it sticks with you when you put some protein with that. Very satisfying lunch. So really handy, really handy lunch. Get that big thing of greens and then those little bags of carrots, little cherry tomatoes, all of those little chopped up vegetables. Just have those in your refrigerator, pull them out, throw them in a big Tupperware, bring them some work. Those little uh, pouches of tuna or salmon that you can rip the top off, those are great for a salad, or a handful of almonds or beans. Super, super simple. Doesn't take five minutes to prepare. You bring it to work, you save yourself a lot of money, and you have a really healthy lunch. Yeah, like you guys. You're all doing that. So, yay. It is true. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of money. And then you fix your own salad the way you really... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're right. Yep, absolutely. So here's the other thing. I've done my own little empirical study on myself, and I can eat a McDonald's cheeseburger in four bites. <laughs> I'm not proud of that. 
But when that's 350 calories. And when you have a great big salad of 350 calories, it takes a long time to chew that and eat that. And you enjoy it more. And you realize I've eaten something. When you gobble something down in four bites, it's gone. So that's the other really good thing about salad is that it, it just takes you a while to, you know, eat it. So enjoy a salad, have a big one, two to three cups, not this one, not that little size salad bowl, but a great big one. Add some berries to it, use olive oil, and then, you know, try to stay away from the things that aren't so healthy like bacon bits and lots of cheese. You can have a little bit, but, you know, that's just, that's a little condiment on top. You really want all those veggies. All right. So there you go. Here's the other thing. If you prefer veggies as, as a soup, that is also a really good way to start a meal. So in the wintertime, you might not want a big salad for lunch. So on the weekend, get your big stock pot out, onions, celery, carrots, garlic, olive oil, get that all happy. Then add your V8 juice and your broth and all the good vegetables. One can of white beans, always. One can of diced tomatoes, always. Green beans maybe one small potato, and then a lot of cabbage and carrots. It's fantastic soup. And then it's in your refrigerator. You can have it for an appetizer. You can bring it to work. If you want to have some more protein in it, you could throw in a little bit of um, perhaps some chicken or some really lean beef. It's great. It's great. You don't even need a recipe. Just make sure you've got lots of garlic and onions and celery and carrots and tomato juice and broth, and I promise it'll be good. <laughs> when you start with all those ingredients. So, um, number 16, I think this is really, really a good habit to get into. Who grew up at a table where all the food was at, on the dinner table at dinner? Yeah, me too. Yep, 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 yep. And um, when it's all on the table and all the bowls and you're all sitting around the table, how easy is it to say, I I'd like some more potatoes? I'll have another, I'll have that little piece of chicken. Pass that on down. We all do that? Okay. So this is about pre-plating your meals. Pre-plating your meals means put the food on the counter, fix your plate, and then go sit down at the table and take your time and eat your meal at the table. It's a lot less likely that you're going to get up and go to the counter and have more if you pre-plate your meal and sit down at the table. It's just a little tip, it's just a little trick, but it really does work. And then if you use that, you know, I have to wait 20 minutes till I can have seconds, you find out, well, I'm really satisfied and I don't need seconds. So very, very um, research shows that people who eat 14% less if they pre-plate. As a mom, who finishes their children's plates at the dinner table? I do. My daughter is 22 years old. She's going to be a senior in college. She's home this summer. We were eating dinner at the table, and she left broccoli and chicken on her plate. And, of course, what do I do? I'm like, give that, give that to your mother. And she's 22 years old. I'm 55. I don't need to finish my daughter's plate anymore. But we get in these habits, you know, and then you just naturally, do, anybody else do that? Yeah, yeah. So very interesting, very interesting. We get into habits. Eating directly out of the box. Think of a bag of chips laying on the couch watching a game. How many, yeah, kind of dangerous kind of dangerous. So always have a snack in a bowl. Don't ever eat directly out of the box. And then, you know, fix your plate. Look at your plate. This looks like a nice plate. I'll go sit down and I'll eat it rather than the plates on the table. So pre-plate not only your meals but also your snacks. Um, look at your food. Be conscious. There's a whole a whole process, a whole way of thinking about eating. They, they call it mindful eating. And it's about being aware. It's about really paying attention. When we eat, eat, just pay attention to eating. Not eating in front of the TV, not eating in front of the computer, just really being aware of this is, this is the time that I enjoy this food. I, and and that, they call that mindful. Um, I like this one, drink your veggies. Has anybody into kind of juicing lately? Has anybody had like a, a veg, like you put all the spinach and stuff in your smoothie and all that jazz? Yeah. It's, Oh, yeah, V8 juice is awesome. There's a great little place here in Kansas City. I think it's called the Filling Station, and they, you know, they put the beets and the spinach and all that stuff. Oh, man, it's so good. It's so good. But actually, you know, she says don't drink your juices because it's a lot of sugar and we lose all the fiber from the fruit, but that's not necessarily so with vegetables. 
Drinking vegetable juice has a lower glycemic index. It has less calories and it's very filling. So a great snack in the afternoon is a big can of V8 juice and a handful of almonds or a big can of V8 juice and a piece of string cheese, some protein and some you know, volume with a low glycemic index that kind of fills you up. That's very, very satisfying. So drinking vegetable juice provides many health benefits. It also reduces, it you know, kind of takes the edge off of your appetite. Back in the old days, do you guys ever remember this? Um, on a menu for an appetizer, they would have a salad or consomme or vegetable juice. Do you ever remember that? That was kind of an old standard way that people used to eat, so it was kind of like an appetizer. It's a really good idea. So, um, and then of course, if you know you have to be careful about salt, you might want to choose a lower sodium. But I personally think that the low, so v low so lower sodium V8 juice is really tasty. It doesn't bother me at all. Has anybody tried it? I mean, it's really vegetable-y. It's really good. I like it. Okay, this is a good one. Did, pardon me? No, I said I'm going to have to find the lower sodium. I like it. I like it. Yep, I think it's pretty good. P highly palatable foods. These are things that have the combination of sugar and salt and fat and texture. Think Doritos. Also think McDonald's. McDonald's french fries are, in all fast food, I'm not just throwing McDonald's under the bus, but all fast food french fries, when they make the potatoes, they cut the potatoes, and then lots of times they um, kind of take them for a swim in some dextrose, which is sugar, a sugar solution, and that kind of sticks to the outside. And then they go into that hot fat, hot oil, and they get caramelized, and then they take them out and they put salt all over them. So you've got starch, you've got sugar, you've got fat, and you've got salt. And who can eat one McDonald's french fry? I can't. Yeah. Yes, exactly, because we like all that, and it, and it triggers that, that pleasure center of our brain, and we're like, yeah, that's really good, I like that, I want some more. So, as a human, our taste buds crave sugar, salt, and fat. We have that on, you know, your, how your tongue has like a bitter place, salt, sweet, all where your taste buds are. So, ultra-palatable, high-fat, high-sugar foods are everywhere, everywhere. Think about when you walk into Quick, Quick Trip, all those twirling hot dogs on the little rotisserie and all those drinks that are on the wall. I mean, it's just really, really highly palatable and right in your face. So the more we want, the more we need. And science shows that flavor, super palatable foods directly stimulate your brain. I mean, we like it. And that's how come one is never enough. So you want to stay away from those things. You know, that big salad, very, very good for you. But it's, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody ever telling me I gained weight because I just couldn't stay away from salad. It doesn't work that way. I mean, we get satisfied. But the other things are dangerous. So make a concerted effort to reduce your access. You know, that's, you know, if they're not in your house, if, if you do not have Doritos and Coke in your house, you will not eat Doritos and Coke. If you have apples and oranges in your house, you'll eat apples and oranges. So, you know, make a concerted effort to do that. And, and then if you are, if you do find those things in your house, there's a couple of tricks that we can do. You can, for example, ice cream. Instead of getting the big gallon thing of ice cream, if you have little ice cream um, bars, like little ice, like the fudge sickles that have 90 calories, or the um, skinny cow ice cream sandwiches that have 140 calories or whatever, you have one that is far less dangerous than I'll have four scoops of chocolate ice cream. So that kind of helps us with portion control. So anyway, um, so just stick with the simple, simple, like a really good dessert right now, cantaloupe, watermelon, all those good fruits that are out there. So just try to stick with simple flavors. Okay, this one, I have a funny story about this one. Take smaller bites. Um, I am a mother that had two children that are about 18 months apart. And so it was a little, and then, and then I have a bonus daughter that came to live with us when she was about 13, 14. So our life was a little crazy. It was a little crazy there. And, and I'm not the only one. Do you, everybody else have kids that are close in age? Yeah, yeah, okay, well, 
my children will ask me things about when did I do this and when did I do that, and honestly, I can't remember. It was just a bit of a zoo, and so sometimes I kind of make it up. <laughs> Your first word was dada, you know? so, because it was all a bit of a blur. So I had these two babies in two high chairs, and I'm like feeding them. And I remember my mother-in-law scolding me because I would take this big old spoonful of mashed potatoes, and my poor boy, he would kind of brace himself in the high chair. He sort of, I remember his little hands. He'd kind of hang on to it, and he'd close his eyes and he'd open his mouth real wide. <laughs> shove it in there. And I remember my mother-in-law scolding me. You are, you're gonna, ch he's gonna choke. That's too big of a bite. And I, I, I was like, I gotta feed him. <laughs> Eat it. <laughs> and then time went on, okay? And then later on in life, my son is in junior high, and my father, my beloved father says, he was watching him eat, and he's appalled. He's like, did you see that? He ate half a pork chop in one bite. And I realized that was my fault from that high chair, like, eat it. So the poor kid, <laughs> he ended up, you know, eating. So my point is, take smaller bites, but we, lear we learn that from a very early age, okay? We learn that at the table. We learn that from when we grow up. And then think about, think about how many kids, okay, you got 10 minutes to eat, and then you get to go outside and play for recess. What are they going to do? Think about soldiers. Okay, we got 10 minutes, and then we got to go, you know. And moms, you got, I got I to gotta get you fed so I can get you in the tub. I mean, that's how we live our life. And then we end up taking big bites, and we end up eating too fast. But we learn it because our, you know, and I think about, I'm a dietitian of all the people in the world who ought to know. I shouldn't be shoving <laughs> food in my children's mouths, but that's how we learn, and those are habits that take a little while to break, but then when you stop and think about, well, why do I do that? That's why we do that. So, taking smaller bites is simple. It's a very simple strategy. It takes longer to eat. You enjoy your food more. You eat less. So, you know, that's just, that's just a, a, a funny story, but I think we all have things like that that have happened to us. So your plan of action, make a conscious, concerted effort to take smaller bites of food and do not shovel mashed potatoes into your children's mouths while they brace themselves in their high chairs. Um, eat more fiber, more on processed foods. It takes longer. Um, just taking smaller bites just might, you know, that might be like one simple trick that would really help you. Another thing that you can do is put your fork down between your, you know, between bites. Just put it down. All right, um, keep it simple. This is number 20, and this has two parts to it. The first part is keep it simple in terms of your food. When we think about highly palatable foods like McDonald's, those are not simple flavors. They're sugar and salt and fat. So when we talk about keep it simple, we're talking about minimizing foods that have the great white hazards. Think of simple foods like chicken, sweet potatoes, broccoli, very satisfying, very filling but very simple flavors. We become satisfied and it doesn't have that same, you know, trigger your brain, I have to have the big fries. It doesn't, it doesn't work quite the same way. So we really want to keep your, your flavors simple. That doesn't mean boring. That doesn't mean, you know, like your food can't taste good, but it's chicken, it's melon, it's broccoli, it's tossed salad. It's not it's not this big melee of all these flavors and sauces and spices and textures and that's what gets us in trouble. The other part of keep it simple is stress. And I think stress should be a whole nother topic all by itself, but we live in a stressful environment. And one of the knee jerk reactions to stress is food because it's comforting. And so what we know is stress is bad for the belly. We know that there's this hormone called cortisol that we make when we are under stress. We know that cortisol helps us lay down fat stores. And the, the, the only thing that we can do is like, sometimes we can't alleviate the stress in our life. We can't make traffic go away. We can't make deadlines go away from our work. We can't, you know, there, we live in this little pressure cooker. And it's very interesting about the human body and stress. We do very, very well with intense stress for very short periods of time. Think about um, taking your child to the emergency room and getting st stitches. And you, and you were calm and they were bleeding all over the place. And you handled it and you figured it out and 
the stress was big, the stress was intense, you were in it, there was a beginning and there was an end, and you went on. And then you look back and you think, how did I do that? How did I handle that? You ever do that? Do you ever have things like that? Okay, yeah, we do very well at that. We're very good at that. What we're not very good at is that long haul of medium stress that there's no escape from. Taking care of a parent with Alzheimer's, managing, managing a job, looking after a child that has trouble. I mean, all of those things th that there is no escape from, that's the harmful kind of stress. We do really well with the intense kind of stress. The long haul of stress, that's what hurts us. So what we know is, we know that one of the things, the best ways to deal with stress is exercise. Doesn't make the problem go away, doesn't find a solution to the problem, but somehow it lightens the load. It gives you the ability to face it again, you know, without having all the negative effects of stress on the body. We also know that, you know, when you're in it with someone else and you're having fun and you're talking about it and you're laughing about it, no matter how bad the situation is, somehow that lightens it up. Have, you, have we ever done that before? And you think, oh my gosh, that was so hard, but I had you. And we had fun and we laughed about it. And remember, and this and that, you know, my belief is if you're not having fun, why bother? wherever it is, whatever it is, but that is really, really true. I mean, keeping your spirits up, laughing about it, confiding about it, huge impact on handling stress. And stress affects our weight. So if you, all of these things, if you can weave all these things in, tell me, so tell me a story. Who's, who has a, like a stress story and you got through it with a family member? Anybody with an Alzheimer's mom or a sick parent? Yes. I have an Alzheimer's mom. Yeah. She, one particular day, I kept calling. My brother kept calling. My daughter kept calling. She did not answer the phone. Mm -hmm. Luckily, she's just right across the street. Mm -hmm. So I had to tell my boss, Dana, I need to go check on my mom. She's not answering the phone. Who knows what's going on? Yeah. So I'm scurrying across the street. <laughs> Traffic's coming. And I walk up her little hill and I knock on the door and the dog starts barking. So I said, okay, that's a good sign. The dog's barking. Yeah. So she opens the door and I'm like, is everything okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything's just fine. I'm like, where's your phone? Mm -hmm. And it's in her pocket. But the buttons are on the outside. So I guess she might have pressed up against it so yeah. it turned the ringer off. Yeah. But then I said, okay, where's your telephone? It was disconnected from the wall and from the phone. Oh my goodness. I said, okay, how did this happen? She didn't remember doing it. Mm -hmm. So she was like, well, I don't know. Somebody did it. Yeah. It's always somebody yeah, did yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> that was a real stressful occasion that yeah, day. Yeah. But you got through it. <laughs> yes, I got through it. Plus, she took a long walk. <laughs> yeah, and she took a long walk. Yeah. And you can laugh about it. Yes. I yeah. That's about yeah. It. Yeah. So that's that's the answer. That's yeah. that's the that's the trick. Mm -hmm. That's the trick. I mean, we can get through it, but you have to talk about it. You got to laugh about it, and it really does lighten it up. Then there's also there's been some really good, interesting studies about tea and the actual making of tea: boiling the water, putting it in a pot, pouring it in your cup. That whole thing is actually really relaxing. And then there's also some antioxidants in tea that are very relaxing. So just another little tip to help you deal with stress. Music, you know, they always say music soothes the soul. It really does soothe the soul. It really does. So music is really good. Um, hot food, actually really spicy food, kind of triggers endorphins. So, you know, little hot food is supposed to be good. Massage, extraordinarily good. And then the whole practice of deep breathing and yoga and all of those things, huge stress relievers huge but you just have to practice it you gotta we first of all we have to accept the fact that we live in a stressful environment okay we have to you know sometimes we're like we're fine we're fine we can deal with it well we all have stress so you have to figure out what how can I where how can I weave these things in to help because you just don't want stress to get the better of you. When you see the blood pressure go up, when you see the scale go up, when you see all those things start to happen, then you have to stop and think about, am I taking care of myself? Is this stress getting the best of me? And there's some things that you can do to really help yourself. So, then the last one is slowing down and enjoying food. Just slow down and eat your, 
eat your meals, you know, that whole, when we were talking about the soldiers and the teachers and the children and, and having only 20 minutes for lunch and gobbling everything up, we really have to get into the whole mindfulness of eating, of taking time and enjoying food and putting your fork down and really enjoying it and being focused on it. That has, you know, it takes 20 minutes for your brain and your stomach to talk to each other and say, I'm, I'm hungry, I'm full, I'm satisfied. But if, if you are eating so fast, it, it, you, it doesn't have time to, check, to catch up. So you gotta slow down and enjoy it. Does anybody have an incredible slow eater in their family? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Is she, are they leaner? Do they tend to be leaner? Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So that whole slowing down and eating, it's really, you know, then they have time to say, I've had food, I'm okay. You don't need more. But it's, it's a habit. It's a habit that you have to cultivate, and it's a habit that you have to break. And when you're a mother and you start feeding your kids scoops of mashed potatoes, they're bracing their high chair, you kind of set them up to lose. So then, you know, we got to take a step back and really practice that so that we can eat a little bit slower. So those are my 20, these are the 21 tips and tricks. I certainly do not, you know, I wouldn't try to do them all at once, but I would you know, really focus on three or four and practice them. And, and then weigh yourself and see what the scale says. And then go back and try some more. And um, it's not a diet, but I do think that it can really help, help you lose some weight and help you kind of look at food a little bit different and experience food a little bit different. So thank you all very much. Well, Any questions you. or comments? When you're eating slow, mm -hmm. how many bites or how many times do you need to chew your food? Forty. Oh, <laughs> really? Is that what? I don't know. I, my grandmother told when we were young, yeah. but I wanted to see what everybody I don't know. I think it probably depends on what you're eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, well, that's... She, I said, well, you make sure you chew your food at least 25 times. Somewhere. Well, that makes... Like, that's like a good idea. That, yeah. Just today. I guess. So, who's going to sit there count? <laughs> but we yeah. Did. Yeah. Wow. So, I make sure that I try to chew... That's that good. keeps me from eating fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and then you taste your food more. You know, you're not just swallowing it. Yeah, exactly. You taste it and you enjoy it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. All righty. Okay. Goodbye, everyone.